All right, so we are talking about ecology still. This will be the fourth PowerPoint out of five. So we are nearing the point where you will be having um, a test I'm a little bit close to the screen. Uh, hopefully you've gotten into kind of the habit of taking notes during this. Um, I'm recording this on Monday, which means tomorrow we will all be running through the protocol of what we do with this information. So hopefully it'll, it will feel more usable. Uh, last week I think you watched a lot of videos and we didn't do much with it right away because you guys were gone. Um, so I think hopefully we'll see the benefit of doing these videos. We're talking about ecology, animal behavior, and this is leading up to an actual animal behavior lab that we'll be doing. Um, there are basically three responses that organisms have to a changing environment. We see physiological responses, we see morphological, and we see behavioral. Uh, physiological is the physical body changing. Uh, this is subconscious, dilating capillaries, panting, things like that. Um, we see changes in anatomy uh, during seasonal changes, so shedding of fur. If you have an animal, you definitely know that that happens, um, things like that. Behavioral responses are going to be um, interactions that they have, moving to favorable locations, fighting, mating, uh, all of those behavioral responses. Um, when we talk about responses, there's a question of is this nature or nurture? Are these learned behaviors or are they genetic? Are they encoded? Um, what we've determined is that both genes and environment um, influence behavior. If you think about, uh, they do lots of uh, studies on um, separated twins um, or people who are adopted and what they find is that people who are adopted actually exhibit a lot of behaviors of the original parent and some of the behaviors of the new parents indicating that genetically they share a lot of behaviors with the original parent as well as the things that they've learned with the new parent. Um, and so everything that we do is partially what we've learned and partially what uh, is just encoded in our genetics. We usually separate into two categories. The innate behavior is uh, developmentally fixed. It means that um, it's always going to happen it's regardless of environment. We will always see it repeatedly. Uh, learned behavior is due to cognitive development and it changes based on an organism's experience um, or teachings. Uh, we see this a lot in uh, organisms that are raised in captivity. The innate behaviors will happen regardless. The learned behaviors are ones that they will basically not be able to do if they don't have someone teaching those things. Um, a lot of like hunting and eating type behaviors are learned by a mother um, and they will really struggle with those if they're raised in captivity without another organism teaching them that. Um, so we need to talk about questions that relate uh, directly to the animal behavior and then the much bigger questions about behavior. When we're studying behavior, we should be thinking about two things. Um, the proximate questions focus on the environmental stimuli that trigger the behavior. Um, what specific thing happened this moment that makes the uh, organism do a certain thing? How does a behavior happen? And when we do the lab, I'll ask you proximate questions. Why did the organism do this thing? And I'll ask, also ask you ultimate questions, which are basically focusing on the evolutionary significance, the why. So we always want to think about uh, what caused that response, and then why is that response beneficial for them for survival. Um, when we look at these behaviors, we should always be thinking in the back of our head, and maybe you want to do this in their notes, though, why, right? Why did they do this? or um, what was what is this a result of, and then how does this benefit them evolutionarily? Um, these are some behaviors that I would jot down. Um, cooperative behaviors are when animals invest uh, resources in common interests, or they basically have something shared with a group. Why? Because this is practical, practical and very safe, the group mentality. Evolutionarily, they will be more likely to survive and be able to hide from uh, predators. Agonistic behaviors are any social behaviors that involve fighting. Uh, it's a contest involving threats. We usually see posturing and threatening behaviors first before an actual fight. Uh, there are three phases, uh, threats, aggression, and submission. Generally, there's no harm if these organisms are within a, a pack. Uh, it's just for dominance. And um, sometimes we will see this. We see this in wild horses. Uh, they're very rare that we see wild horses at all, but uh, male 
stallions that oversee a herd will like physically inflict pain on horses that are trying to come into the group. Um, but a lot of the time it's just uh, jockeying for dominance, especially when there are multiple males within the group. Um, they just establish a hierarchy. When there are packs when there's only one male within that group, uh, horses and I can't think of anything else off the top of my head we can talk about in class, um, they will try to chase away the other, uh, the single males basically. Uh, reconciliation behavior op often happens after that agonistic behavior. Uh, we see uh, grooming and physical interactions. Um, this is why we as humans, a lot of the time when we fight with people, or if you and I think about like in my relationship, um, or like with my parents or with anyone, uh, when after we fought, we may feel better if we like hug someone. Um, physical interactions kind of signal like this conflict is over and animals do that too. Uh, when we talk about like why organisms will engage in agonistic behavior, it's to establish a dominance hierarchy which basically creates a rank um, among the individuals in the group. We always have our alpha. Usually um, the males will be in an alpha role uh, and then females will be in the beta rankings, but basically the alpha organisms control the behaviors of others. This is not always the case. There are female alpha positions within certain groups of organisms. Um, it really varies from group to group, and if you're curious, you can look about um, uh, a patriarchal or a patriarch versus a matriarch and the societies within animal organisms that those exist in. Um, so when we talk about other types of behavior, one that is important to think about is a fixed action pattern or a FAP. Uh, this is a sequence of unlearned or innate behaviors that once they start, they are carried out to completion every time. Uh, they are triggered by specific stimuli and um, they continue, the whole behavior happens. Um, that is whether or not they determine that the the influence, whatever it is, let's say this fish gets scared, um, but then whatever is frightening them goes away, that fixed action pattern will have to go to completion the whole time. Um, they don't have any control of that. An example is a three-spine stickleback, which is a fish in response uh, to the red underside of an intruder fish. They will have a specific behavior, um, and this is a specific... Uh, a specific uh, experiment that was done to basically show that um, every single time they see red, they're going to exhibit a certain behavior. Think of it as, and they exhibit this like aggressive behavior. Think about beta fish. They do the same if you ever hold something red next to a beta fish. They're going to like puff up and do this like attack thing. They don't physically have control over it. They do it, right, just at the red color, regardless of what that organism actually is. Um, that is a fixed action pattern. Blowfish do it when they puff up. Um, I'm trying to think of other organisms, but think of any organism that automatically changes size or does something in response to aggression or being like startled that they don't have much control over. It just naturally happens. Um, another type of behavior that you should be able to identify is imprinting. It's a type of behavior that is both uh, learning and innate, so genetic and environmental, and it's irreversible. Once an organ organism has imprinted upon another organism, that's it. Um, this is during the uh, early phase of an animal's development, and so we call it the critical period where certain things can be learned. This is why when, if uh, you know anyone who's ever had a child or you've been around really young cousins, people kind of keep track of uh, when are they learning language? When are they learning to walk? When are they doing these things? Because there's a certain window of time where they really need to learn those things or else their capacity to do that is going to be very limited. Uh, it's why there are certain things in the first couple years of birth that organisms should learn how to do. Um, one of those things for a lot of mammals is imprinting. We did it uh, depending upon who was kind of the main person in our life uh, at a very young age. Uh, this is an example, and it's actually a movie, you can go look it up, about um, these goslings who imprinted upon this uh, person specifically because they were raised from an incubator. Um, it's totally possible. It happens all the time. 
this is the movie Fly Away Home. The Canadian geese basically imprint upon um, a person and they have to teach them a certain amount of things. Just anecdotal, not important really. Um, so other things that we should know. Um, when we think about imprinting, that is getting towards more towards the genetic innate um, behaviors. And when we start thinking about non-mammals, um, we have a lower level of the ability to think about the decisions we're making. If you think about an insect, if you think about a fish, uh, all of these like smaller organisms, it's probably assumed that they're not thinking like, I'm going to do this for my pack or I'm doing this to be the most safe. They don't have that. We It's happens in the frontal lobe, but it's reasoning. And we have what we call directed movements, which is basically innate things that are going to happen that help them, uh, that help them protect themselves without having that frontal lobe to reason. Um, these are always controlled by genes, so all the organisms will do it identical. They, identically, they don't need to learn it from a parent. Um, the first is kinesis. It's change in activity in response to a stimuli. Um, isopods, uh, beetles, things like that, they will respond to dampness. This is why we see organisms under rotting things and in damp areas. They respond to the, uh, the dryness and they move towards more moisture. Uh, taxis is uh, more or less automatic. It basically involves movement towards or away a stimuli. Uh, the most impressive organisms that do this are actually plants. They respond to um, sunlight. If you've ever put uh, something growing on a windowsill, it's going to move towards the, um, the sunlight, and that would be an example of them just moving towards a stimuli. They don't have the frontal lobe capacity to think, I'm moving towards this resource I need. They just do it. Uh, the last one is migration. This is also super innate. All organisms, if they do migrate, will do this inherently. They use the sun and the seasonal changes to determine where they need to go. Um, birds do this. Fish do this. Um, a lot of packs do this based on food and weather um, and the availability of resources. Um, some other things that we should know um, when we talk about how animals are interacting, uh, the signal is going to be the behavior that causes the change, and then the communication involves the transmission and the reception of uh, responses to signals. So the signal is always going to be the initial, um, the initial behavior, and then the communication is going to be the back and forth. This is the backbone of community ecology, right? When we looked at our lab, Yesterday, we talked a lot about um, two different species. So we went from population ecology, kind of talked about a community ecology, but there are communication between organisms, and this um, allows us to kind of seamlessly talk both about population and community ecology. Um, there's a bunch of different types of communication that we need to know about. Uh, chemical is going to be either pheromones, which is a chemical released for reproduction, uh, certain scents, so... Um, when organisms, so like a cat and a dog who have not been spayed or neutered, they can release a scent that marks territory. Skunks do this to um, try to scare away predators. Uh, another is auditory communication or vocalization. This is going to be um, noises made to communicate. Uh, birds, crickets, flies beating their wings, um, all these different types that are uh, vocalizing communication. Humans, right, we actually communicate verbally. Um, so I want to kind of step back and look big picture again. Um, we've talked a lot about the different types of communication and behaviors that we see and um, how our environment plays a role. Because a lot of those initially are uh, something genetic, right? My behaviors are pretty genetic. And then my environment, how I was raised, where I grew up, uh, or, you know, for a, any other animal, that, that environment is going to impact um, how those traits are manifested. Uh, environmental factors, as simple as diet, the nature of social interactions, the opportunities for uh, learning can influence the de development of the behavior. So 